Welcome to a special webinar brought to you by the AKC Canine Health Foundation. In today's webinar, we hear from internationally recognized veterinary orthopedic surgeon, Dr. Sherman Knapp. Dr. Knapp completed a combined DVM and Master's of Clinical Science in Surgery at Kansas State University. He is a diplomate of the American College of Veterinary Surgeons and is certified in canine rehabilitation, stem cell therapy, and tibial plateau leveling osteotomy, or TPLO therapy. To date, he has performed more than 2,000 TPLO procedures to stabilize the stifle joint after ruptures of the cranial cruciate ligament. Dr. Knapp has the extreme honor to be named a charter diplomate in the newly recognized American College of Veterinary Sports Medicine and Rehabilitation. In this webinar, Dr. Knapp discusses the recent progress in the use of regenerative medicine to treat orthopedic injuries and also identifies areas where further research is needed. Listen along as he explains the different types of therapy that fall under the category of regenerative medicine. Dr. Knapp will also present the stories of three canine clients whose lives are drastically improved through this exciting and innovative treatment. I'm Dr. Sherman Knapp with the Veterinary Orthopedic and Sports Medicine Group, and the primary objectives of this talk will be looking at regenerative medicine as a treatment for orthopedic sports medicine conditions. And the two most important portions of regenerative medicine that we're going to be covering is the use of stem cell therapy and what's known as platelet-rich plasma, or PRP. And the way we'll go through this presentation is talk a little bit about these two types of uh, therapies, and then we'll look at actual clinical cases. We'll describe the, the dogs that had the injuries, how we work these cases up with diagnostics, the use of these two types of therapies or the combination of these therapies, and the follow-up with physical therapy, and then lastly, their return to full function. The most important part is that you have to have a definitive diagnosis in order to know what the appropriate treatment should be in that particular dog that you're treating. It's not just a silver bullet using stem cell therapy or PRP, and it's also a combination therapy. It's not just injecting these cells or these um, new treatments that we have available in veterinary medicine, but it's working with the key players, such as the general veterinarian, the physical therapist, or rehabilitation therapist. It's a combination many times with additional medical management or even different types of physical therapy type devices, such as orthotics, that we'll be seeing in some of these cases uh, coming up. When we talk about stem cell therapy, it really sometimes confuses people and as to where do these cells come from. And really, every cell in our body or every location in our body truly possesses stem cells. And if we were, whether we're a dog, a horse, a person, and these stem cells can come from numerous places in the body. For instance, if we're talking about a dog, it can be coming from their bone, it can be coming from their joint tissue or their synovium, it can be coming from sources such as fat. And these cells within, say, for instance, areas of fat within our own dog's body have stem cells, and these stem cells are capable of differentiating or turning into other types of tissues, such as bone, cartilage, tendon, muscle, and so forth. And somehow these stem cells work through what's called a cell differentiation type pathway. In other words, these cells can actually divide and separate and turn into the type of tissue that's injured, or they send a signal to other stem cells in the area that has the disease or the injury to turn on and start replicating and start healing those tissues as well. It was once thought early on that we had to use bone marrow as our source of stem cells for this type of treatment. And later research has shown that you can also use fat. So taking small amounts of fat from your dog and then basically processing these cells, whether you culture these cells or do what's called fractionated, allows you to then potentially regenerate or use these cells to help heal all these different types of tissues, liver, uh, cartilage, bone, nerve, cardiac, muscle, and so forth. And so the nice thing about using fat is that it's very low morbidity. You can make a very small incision, take out a small amount of fat, process this, and then inject it into various locations in your dog's body or even the joint, say if you have osteoarthritis, to allow these cells to do their work and help these tissues heal. Early on, the research that was done, particularly in dogs, was for the use of osteoarthritis or cartilage defects or cartilage injury in dogs. But now, more and more research has been done in humans and also horses, and we've extrapolated from that data and started using that in dogs as well for the use of tendon, ligament injury, and more recently, even spinal conditions or spinal cord injury. So for now, the indications for dogs for the use of regenerative medicine or stem cell therapy and PRP is osteoarthritis, ligament injury, tendon injury, and spinal conditions. The one thing that's contraindicated that we must be careful of is neoplastic conditions or cancer. 
Stem cells or PRP help the body to regenerate, help with cell turnover, and speed up a healing process. And the one thing that we don't want to do is stimulate any type of area that may have cancer within the body or use it in patients that have an underlying cancer type disease. So many, many veterinarians as well as other health professionals are under the impression that really there's no true evidence-based medicine when it comes to the use of regenerative medicine, whether it's stem cell or PRP. And the reality is, unfortunately, in the mainstream magazines or journals that we read, the evidence has yet to show up. But if you dig deeper into the true scientific literature, there's numerous papers out there, objective, placebo-controlled, clinical trials, and benchtop research that have showed significant improvement in soft tissue injuries such as tendon and ligament, the use of osteoarthritis and cartilage defects, as well as neurological disease. It's just unfortunately these publications or papers have not made it quite yet to the mainstream type literature that most veterinarians get that it sits on their desktop on a daily basis. But to date there are numerous, numerous, numerous studies that are out there and this is just an example of some of those um, for soft tissue osteoarthritis and neurologic disease. The next question is how do we actually go through the processing for dogs for stem cell therapy? If we're using fat, or we call this adipose tissue, we make a small incision, and ideally this is in the falsa form in the abdomen, so a little keyhole incision into your dog's abdomen right there along its belly to take a small amount of fat, and then that fat will get sent off and processed or processed in-house. Then we obtain these syringes either through the processing or the in-house processing, and the syringes then contain the stem cells that we will go ahead and inject into the area of disease or injury. That too is a very important point. Having stem cells available is wonderful for the potential to improve your dog's outcome as far as injury and return to normal function, but really the most important thing as well as having good cells to work with is being able to guide those cells into the appropriate location. So we inject these uh, cells via either what's known as fluoroscopy, which is basically a real-time x-ray, or under ultrasound guidance. It's absolutely crucial that we get the cells to the exact location where the injury is in the disease process that we're treating. Next type of regenerative medicine, as opposed to stem cell therapy, is platelet-rich plasma. And this is essentially blood plasma concentrated from platelets. So think about when, you're, when you cut yourself, what forms that little clot um, and allows you to stop bleeding are platelets. That's one of the key components. Well, in those platelets, it's now been found to have very, very what's known as bioactive proteins or growth factors that actually help to stimulate healing, accelerate tendon and ligament repair and regeneration. So very, very potent abilities to help the body heal. So essentially for this type of therapy, you collect blood from your dog, it's spun down in a centrifuge, and then the platelets are increased in concentration and are taken off that blood sample and then injected into the area of the ligament, the tendon, or the joint for osteoarthritis to allow for new tissue formation or decrease of inflammation and to allow these tissues to help to heal. When it comes to evidence-based medicine, again, there are numerous, numerous reports out there on the use of platelet-rich plasma. And if you just Google this, for instance, and you look here at this example, there's numerous football players, soccer stars, baseball players, racehorses, and so forth that have had platelet-rich plasma successfully for the treatment of tendon and ligament injury. But the problem that we were looking at in dogs, especially sporting dogs or active dogs, whether it's a dog doing agility or field trial work or a person's dog who's running around creating an agility, do an agility field in the backyard chasing squirrels or chasing the frisbee, is that they can get repetitive injury, repetitive activity type injuries, and such as tendon injuries. So if you think of how tendon heals in any species, many times it heals by scar tissue. So we have scar tissue formation rather than regeneration. If you get scar tissue within a tendon in particular, you lose a lot of the elasticity, and therefore the healing time is extensive and re-injury is common. So the question is then, how do we actually treat these tendon injuries in dogs, or more importantly, how do we treat this thing called a core lesion? And what we mean by that is not that we have a cut in the tendon or what's known as an avulsion where the tendon actually rips off the bone, but if we have disruption within the tendon itself, that's known as a core lesion. There's nothing there to do surgery on. There's no way to actually suture these back together, so we have to figure out how best to try to allow these to heal. If we allow them to heal on their own, again, predisposed to scar tissue, which is not going to be as elastic, prone to re-injury, and potential further breakdown. So the thought was, could we use regenerative medicine-type technologies? 
So we have stem cells, which we know the roles and the functions are to contribute to generating new tissues, to bring in stem cells from the area and turn those stem cells that are on in that particular area of injury, to make new matrix or a scaffold, to bring in blood supply, to slow down cell death or what's called antiapoptosis, to reduce inflammation, and also to block that scar tissue, or if it's already there, potentially break it down and replace it with normal healthy tendon tissue. And then if we think about the roles of platelets, or PRP, we know it has a positive effect on bringing in blood supply and also acting as a scaffold. It too will turn on the cells in that location or stimulate stem cells. And it has that fibrin. Think again of when we cut ourselves, how it forms that little scab or clot. And this, this little fibrin matrix, if you call it, could be a scaffold to allow for tissue healing as well. So with platelet-rich plasma, again, Lots of people say, well, there's no evidence out there. There's nothing in the literature that shows that injecting these platelet-rich plasma or PRP into soft tissues or into the joint frost or arthritis will actually improve the healing of these types of locations. And once again, jumping into the literature, as you see in this slide, there are numerous reports, and these are recent reports, on the use for soft tissue injury. So it was the thought that could we combine these types of therapies? Could we take stem cells and add it to the PRP for the best in tendon or soft tissue healing. So we'd have cells for regeneration, which are the stem cells. We'd have the growth factors coming from the PRP, and we'd also have the scaffold from the PRP to allow those stem cells to set up and start to heal in the location of injury. So essentially, looking at this slide, what we have is a collection of a small amount of fat from your dog and blood. We would then either process in-house or send these samples off to a local lab. They would process these samples and send them back to us, or we'd process in our own lab here at VOSM. Now the next key important factor is to inject under ultrasound guided guidance into the area of injury, and then lastly, enter back into the physical therapy or rehabilitation program. Remember, it's not the silver bullet just using the, the regenerative medicine type techniques. There is rehabilitation therapy that's equally important. So we began working with the Marion DuPont Equine Medical Center associated with Virginia Tech about four to five years ago in collaboration, looking at the use of this combined stem cell therapy with PRP for various tendon injuries, including the Achilles tendon, the biceps, flexor carpial narrus, which is a tendon in the wrist, the subscapularis and supraspinatus, which are essentially rotator cuff tendons in the shoulder, just like people would get, and iliopsoas, which is a hip flexor um, strain that we see commonly in dogs as well. We wanted to make sure that we were extremely objective in both our workups, because diagnosis is key, as we discussed earlier, as well as objectively following these patients over time to see that we truly are getting healing. So we would start out with a definitive diagnosis through either MRI, ultrasound, or arthroscopy. We would also do a gait analysis, and you'll see examples of that coming up in future videos. And we would do goniometric measurements, in other words, the range of motion of that joint, as well as limb circumference, looking at the muscle mass either in a front leg or a back leg to see how much atrophy is there, and then be able to objectively determine over time if the dog is using the leg more appropriately that the muscle mass is getting increased. Then we wanted an objective follow-up, in other words, evidence-based medicine. How do we objectively analyze that this technology is working? So every 30 days, the dogs would come back in for ultrasound. We would do a gait analysis every 30 days to make sure the lameness was improving. If needed, we would do a second look arthroscopy or look inside the joints as well, the measurements of the range of motion as well as the muscle mass circumference. The tissues, as mentioned earlier, were fat tissue from the falciform or that small keyhole incision into the abdomen, blood collection, tissues were then processed and sent back and under ultrasound guide and injected, and then back into a standardized rehab protocol. So this is how we treated all of these different various tendons in our clinical trial associated with our collaboration with Virginia Tech. So what I'd like to do now is go through some various cases of dogs that have had conditions and soft tissue injuries, tendon injuries, which we've treated using regenerative medicine technology, combination stem cell therapy with PRP. This first case, Sophia, is a very, very nice 20-month-old English Mastiff puppy. And she came up acutely lame at a dog park episode. She was running around playing at the dog park, at doggy daycare essentially, and got T-boned by another large dog and came up very lame on her hind leg. The owners took the dog to the veterinarian. He placed the dog on a dog aspirin and told the clients that they should rest the dog over the next few weeks. 
And unfortunately, Sophia's lameness continued and the swelling down around her ankle continued as well. So the referring veterinarian sent this case for Sophia and her owners to VOSM for a workup. The first step in the workup was to do radiographs or take x-rays. And you can see in this top image to the right, that's the ankle of a dog. And you can see right there at the heel bone, there's a big increased area of white. And that is soft tissue swelling at the area of the Achilles tendon, right where it attaches to the bone, just like it would in a person. We then decided we needed more advanced technology, so we did an MRI on Sophia and found that she did actually have disruption within her Achilles tendon, and we did a follow-up ultrasound on Sophia as well. And there you can see in the bottom right that there is an area that's dark gray to black along that longitudinal or long tendon type uh, area. And you can see that is the area within the Achilles tendon that's also injured. This is an example of the ultrasound in cross-section. In other words, looking directly through the tendon. To the left is the tendon that's injured for Sophia. To the right is the normal tendon. And you can see there in the very center, if it look at like a circular structure, there's a big black hole essentially in the center of that. That is the core lesion we talked about earlier, or disruption within the actual tendon body itself compared to the slide on the right or the image on the right, that's the healthy tendon in Sophia's other Achilles tendon on the opposite leg. So the first thing we had to do is protect that tendon from further breakdown. So this example on the slide on the left is an orthotic. It's a support wrap that's on the what we call the hock or the ankle of a dog with thermoplast or a piece of plastic that's in there to give some extra support. Sophia is a big massive, so we want to make sure she doesn't continue to injure or damage that Achilles tendon. The slide on the right shows Sophia being prepped for a small incision for us to obtain some fat to do stem cell therapy with PRP treatment. The slide on the left is a small incision that you can see that we've made, and that's a small amount of fat that we're taking out of Sophia from an area called the falciform, so right along the little uh, belly or abdominal region. That's placed into a container, and then we will FedEx that out to the lab, which will do the processing for the stem cells. The stem cell processing takes about 10 to 14 days if the cells are cultured versus having it done immediately in-house if we're going to do what's called fractionated or immediate processing. In this particular slide, what you're seeing is one of the regenerative medicine uh, specialists doing an ultrasound-guided injection of the combination stem cell therapy with PRP into Sophia's Achilles tendon. This is the ultrasound images. The slide on the left shows that black hole that you can see once again, and you can see a small little white area right about 11 o'clock, if you would, from that black hole, and that's the needle coming into Sophia's core lesion. Now the slide on the right, you don't see that black hole any longer because that's following the injection, so we can actually tell that that needle went into the right place and filled up that black hole, if you would, with stem cells and PRP. So following the injection is very, very important to continue to protect the tendon. For stem cells and PRP to work, you have to have some sort of biomechanical load or some degree of load. That means we have to have some pressure applied across the tendon so the stem cells know they need to do some job, their job in order to allow this tendon to heal or to activate them, if you would. So we want to add some load to Sophia's Achilles tendon, but at the same time somewhat protect it. So this is a hinged functional brace or a hinged functional orthotic, which allows us to slowly over time add more and more pressure to that Achilles tendon. So post-injection, you can see Sophia is walking down the hallway, leaving VOSM. She's going to be heading back to Delaware in her orthotic to enter back into her physical therapy program in Delaware with her rehabilitation therapist. 30 days following the injection, Sophia has come back in. You can see the hinged braces off of her hock or off her ankle. The swelling has gone down tremendously in her Achilles tendon, and you can see her standing fairly naturally or normally on that left hind leg compared to when she presented. So we're going to go ahead and do the follow-up ultrasound at 30 days to make sure that we see that the tendon is healing appropriately. Then we'll do another one at 60 days and then another one at 90 days. Typically, 90 days is when we see the final healing in dogs that have tendon injury and have been injected with combination stem cell PRP uh, treatment. This slide on the top left shows the initial injury. You can see in the very center where the dark hole is in the center of the Achilles tendon, that was the correlation we initially looked at. 
If we look at 30 days, the slide to the right, you can see that is slowly filling in nicely with, we call it a homogeneous appearance or a more normal appearance within that green area. And now down at the bottom slide at 60 days, you can see in that same circular area a nice granular appearance. It's, we call this homogeneous, meaning it's a nice normal appearance to that tendon compared to the original core lesion, if you would, that she had at presentation. This slide shows that we're going to slowly add some more weight to that Achilles tendon or more what we call biomechanical load. So allow her to add more pressure to the Achilles. So we'll adjust the orthotic and then send her back for physical therapy, back to her rehabilitation therapist that she's working with in Delaware. At 90 days, which is typically the amount of time it takes for the stem cell slash PRP therapy combination to allow these soft tissues to heal, you can see Sophia is completely out of her brace. You can see the Achilles tendon or the tendon there going down to her region of her ankle or hock. The swelling is down. And now if you look in this bottom video, she's walking very nicely with no lameness outside of her brace. We want to continue with objective evidence-based medicine. So not only is ultrasound a very, very important modality to allow us to follow these injuries out over time to make sure we're seeing complete tendon healing, but we also want to use what's called gait analysis. In other words, when the dog walks down this long mat, are they placing equal pressure or as near equal pressure as they can for this particular breed and dog um, on that mat? So this is Sophia walking down the mat. Um, there's thousands of sensors in this mat, and the computer is an extremely sensitive software that will allow us to see how much pressure she's placing in all four of her limbs. And ideally, we'd like to see that the back two limbs are very, very equal, if not identical, between left and right, or injured and non-injured. This is the printout that you would have, and we see immediately from the software on the gait analysis. And if we look at the bottom box to the bottom right, you'll see the front legs and the back legs. If we concentrate on the back, the left hind and the right hind, you can see 76.7 and 76.0. So she's bearing almost identical, the same amount of weight in both her hind limbs. If she was still uncomfortable or if she was still lame or not completely healed from her tendon injury, she would not be bearing anywhere near that same amount of weight that she is, as you can see here, at the 90-day post-treatment. This is Sophia coming back to one of the courses that we held at VOSM for, re, uh, for rehabilitation therapy, and she came uh, in to be a demo dog to show how she has successfully healed through regenerative medicine and through rehabilitation therapy. You can see that the swelling is still down, and she's able to walk and get back to doggy daycare and, and, her, and, her, um, and her normal activity without the, the brace on her ankle or on her hock. Here she is walking down the gait analysis mat, again at 180 days, and to date, Sophia is out long term with no brace, no signs of recurrence or re-injury, and still able to play at her doggy daycare and has returned to being a completely normal dog and is very happy, as are we, with Sophia's outcome. So this is Chloe from Virginia, and she is a very interesting case. She's a five-year-old female fade boxer that had a one-year history of left forelimb lameness. Chloe is a very interesting case in that she had been referred to us by another specialty center where the surgeons and the rehabilitation therapists had already diagnosed her and worked her up and began rehabilitation therapy for a condition called a supraspinatus tendinopathy. And this is one of the most common forelimb conditions we see in dogs, one of the most common tendon injuries we see in dogs, and this is similar to a rotator cuff injury in a human. Sophia was not responding to rest, not responding to dog aspirins, and not responding to rehabilitation therapy uh, since the one year that she had been diagnosed. So on physical exam, we found that Chloe had a decreased range of motion in the left shoulder. She had significant spasm and discomfort when we place her shoulder through range of motion. She had what's called spasm on abduction. In other words, when we took her shoulder and placed it through some of the rotator cuff type stress tests, she had discomfort. And she also had quite a bit of atrophy. Despite the fact that Chloe had been in rehabilitation therapy for the last year, was still not able to get the muscle mass back in that forelimb. This is the video clip of Chloe having her gait analysis, and you can see a very, very persistent and continuous, um, significant forelimb lameness. And down is sound, so you can see every time she comes down on that right forelimb, that means she's pulling up on the left forelimb. So pretty consistent and significant left forelimb lameness. And this is after a year of rehabilitation therapy, resting, and non-steroidals, and she still is this lame. 
this is our data from Chloe on the gait analysis. So again, if we look at the bottom right corner, you can see the left front leg. If we look at the pressure, 25. If we look at the right, 58. So a significant difference, almost double the amount of pressure she's placing in the right forelimb, which is the good forelimb, compared to the left forelimb in which she has the injury for the supraspinatus tendon. These are the radiographs or the x-rays that we're taking from Chloe, and they're actually normal. That's one of the challenges that we have with soft tissue injury or in particular rotator cuff injuries in dogs is that the x-rays we typically take are within normal limits because these show the bony structures but don't show the soft tissue structures. Chloe had come in with her own MRI previously performed by the referral center that sent her into us. And you can see here on the left, this is her MRI and where the arrow is pointing. That is basically the area of inflammation or fatty replacement, we would call it, where the tendon is injured. The slide or image to the right slow shows the top arrow is where the tendon has been swelling with scar tissue over time, and it's actually starting to compress another tendon in the shoulder, the biceps tendon, and cause secondary pain to that tendon because of the significant swelling over time from that primary tendon injury. This is the ultrasound on Chloe, and you can see the area outlined in green and the dark area inside. Once again, that term we use core lesion or disruption within the tendon or breakdown within the tendon. So that big black hole is the area of injury to Chloe's tendon, of the supraspinatus tendon. This image is an arthroscopy or a visualization within the actual shoulder joint through a scope uh, known as arthroscopic procedure. And you can see here that long tubular structure, the white tubular structure, is the biceps tendon. And the structure to the left that looks like it's basically coming into direct contact with that tubular structure is the supraspinatus. So this tendon has had such tremendous swelling over the last few years from this injury that it's actually compressing or impinging or pressing on, if you would, the biceps tendon causing secondary biceps tendon pain. So for Chloe, we elected to use stem cell therapy with PRP combination as we had in the previous case when we talked about Sophia. So this is a example of a video clip of the regenerative medicine specialist doing an ultrasound guided injection into Chloe's tendon, injecting stem cells and PRP. Then we entered Chloe right back into the same standardized rehab program that she had been in prior to the referral to the USM so that she could go back to starting to build back muscle mass, range of motion, and additional comfort within that shoulder. This is 60 days after the injection, and you can see a dramatic improvement already as you watch Chloe walking through our gait analysis room um, at a walk and at a trot. This is the ultrasound of Chloe 90 days post-injection of stem cell therapy PRP combination. You can see the slide on the left shoulder compared to the slide on the right shoulder at this point at 90 days are very, very similar in appearance. We want to make sure we always compare to the opposite shoulder. That's what we use as an internal control, if you would, to make sure that the tendon ends up coming back to the similar size and similar structure as far as what we call echogenicity or the look of the tendon or the pattern within the tendon to make sure we have complete normal healing. When it comes to evidence-based medicine, it's important to follow these cases out long-term or over time. This is Chloe out 12 months post-injection walking with the owner, and you can see as we are walking significant improvement compared to what you saw with the initial gait analysis. This is, again, Chloe doing another gait pattern. We saw a walk, we're seeing a trot, 12 months post-injection. Again, significant improvement compared to what we had prior to the treatment with stem cell therapy and PRP combination. This is the physical examination on Chloe 12 months following stem cell therapy and PRP injections. The range of motion is comfortable within Chloe's shoulder. When we do the stress and the stress test and the stretches to Chloe's shoulder, there's no signs of pain, no signs of spasm. Her muscle mass has come back to normal and equals what she has on the opposite shoulder. This is an example of the data from the gait analysis that we looked at. This was the pre-injection or the baseline. Looking at the bottom right corner, you can see the forelimb, the left forelimb versus the right. There's 25 versus 58. So again, was bearing almost half the amount of weight or pressure in the injured leg compared to the normal leg. 
This is 30 days post-injection of stem cell and PRP combination. You can see we're having a much improved gait analysis reading between the left forelimb and the right forelimb, now 43 and 64. This is 90 days following the stem cell injection PRP combination. Looking at the bottom right, you can see the left forelimb 48, the right forelimb 40. So continuing to improve in our gait analysis, both at a walk and a trot. This is the 12-month follow-up long-term for Chloe. Looking at the left forelimb compared to the right forelimb, you can see even continued improvement, almost identical between the left and right forelimb for Chloe at a walk and at a trot. Chloe continues to do well, is able to run, jump, and return to normal activities. Owner is, the owner is very, very happy with Chloe's outcome, and so far has been no signs of recurrence of her lameness or injury. This is Bayer. Bayer is an agility dog, a five-year-old male castrated border collie from Philadelphia. Byers had an intermittent right forelimb lameness and has been noted to be pulling out of weave holes and taking very, very wide sweeping turns. Any of us that are familiar with border collies or especially agility realize that this breed of dog can turn on a dime and that is not what Byers has been able to do in the agility ring uh, for this owner for quite some time. Bayer had been seen by Bayer's general veterinarian as well as a rehabilitation therapist, was not responding to rehabilitation therapy, was not responding to rest, and was not responding to dog aspirin or non anti-inflammatories. As Bayer's owner would allow Bayer to increase activity, we'd see a further lameness and this condition kept coming back. Bayer was previously diagnosed before the referral to VOSM with a condition called medial shoulder syndrome. Again, just like a, a rotator cuff injury in the shoulder, this is injury to the tendons and the ligaments within the shoulder, very, very common and similar to what we see in humans with rotator cuff injuries. On physical examination for Bayer, we did a gait analysis, and we found that there was a shortened step length, stride length, and decreased pressure at baseline in Bayer's injured limb. We found that there was muscle atrophy. We found that there were restrictions and discomfort when placing Bayer's shoulder through range of motion. The picture to the bottom right shows an objective measure looking at goniometric measurements. We're using this little, what looks like a ruler that allows us to measure the angles of Bayer's shoulder. And you can see that there's an increased angle in the injured leg of 45 degrees compared to the normal leg of 30 degrees. This is an x-ray of Bayer's shoulder. And this is an x-ray that shows no abnormalities. Once again, we're dealing with soft tissue injuries, so it can be extremely challenging to diagnose these conditions with plain x-rays. This is an arthroscopic view of Bayer's shoulder at the time of surgery. So we are looking at the shoulder joint, almost like we're scuba diving, if you would, inside the actual shoulder. And what you can see, cartilage is white, so the, think of the shoulder joint as a ball and socket. So the ball portion is to the bottom and the socket portion is to the top, and you see lots of inflammation. That's the red areas. You see these white areas that are very frayed, almost like feathers, and you can see that there's lots and lots of areas of disruption and inflammation. And as we work our way through this video clip, you're going to see to the far right of the top video that it looks like somebody took a pair of scissors and just started clipping away at buyers, what's called super, uh, subscapularis tendon. And this is a very, very disrupted tendon. In the bottom video clip to the bottom right, you can also see the biceps tendon to the far right. That is a healthy looking tendon, but right next to the biceps tendon to the left is that subscapularis tendon or one of the tendons of the rotator cuff of the shoulder, which shows some very, very significant disruption. We called this owner from the operating room and we told the owner how significant the disruption was within Bayer's shoulder and told her that we could either reconstruct this shoulder or we could enter Bayer into our clinical trial that's using combination stem cell therapy with PRP and allow Bayer's shoulder to heal using regenerative medicine and re rehabilitation therapy and inform Bayer's owner that if Bayer did not make a complete recovery following this treatment, that then we would have to do a full reconstruction down the road and Bayer's owner elected to enroll Bayer into the regenerative medicine clinical trial that we were doing with stem cell and PRP combination. So for Bayer, we use a combination of adipose or fat cells mixed with PRP. 
we place Fire in a device called Hobbles, which is a sup shoulder support system that allows Fire to have normal range of motion on the shoulder, but protect from the abnormal range of motion where that shoulder may slip out to the side. And then we wanted to do objective follow-ups with Fire, so we did a second look arthroscopy, sliding that small scope into the joint at 90 days to make sure everything healed appropriately, as well as the objective gait analysis and objective orthopedic assessment. We entered Bayer back into the same rehabilitation therapy program that Bayer was in before, following the stem cell PRP injections. At 90 days, Bayer came back in for an objective assessment, and we found that Bayer had improved pressure on gait analysis, improved range of motion within the right shoulder, no discomfort or spasm as we did stress tests and angles to check within the shoulder, and that the angles in the shoulder, if you look at the bottom left, had continued to improve and were almost identical between left and right at 90 days. This slide is the arthroscopic view 90 days following stem cells with PRP injection. You'll see that the inflammation has gone down significantly. We see less what we call fibrillation or inflammation of the cartilage as well, and what we'll see as well is regeneration or healing of that subscapularis tendon. What we did not expect to see are those red blotches that you can see along that ligament. That's called the MGL ligament, or one of the ligaments of the shoulder that's a stabilizer of the shoulder. Ligaments are typically very devoid of blood supply. That's why they take so long to heal. And what we found now through this case and numerous other cases is that the stem cell PRP combination stimulates the body to bring in blood supply to these areas that are typically devoid of significant blood supply, which allows these areas to help heal. You can see that in the bottom right slide as well. These red blotchy areas within the tendon and within the ligament are areas of the term is neovascularization or angiogenesis, which is new healthy blood supply being brought into areas of disease or injury allowing these tissues to further heal. When it comes to the use of regenerative medicine technology or stem cell therapy or PRP combination, not only is the goal for us to be able to allow these tissues to heal or the injury to heal, but our true goal is to allow these dogs to get back to the sport they love or the activity that they love. And for us, the real testimony was, can these dogs get back to their previous level of training or competition? This slide that you can see here in the bottom is buyer back to competition six months following the use of stem cell PRP combination injections into the shoulder and physical therapy. Bayer is back to complete competition and is doing as well on the agility field as Bayer was doing prior to the injury. Again, in wanting long-term follow-up and true evidence-based medicine, can these cells do what they need to do long-term for these patients? We're bringing these dogs back in at a year, at two years, and so forth for follow-up. So this is Bayer at 12 months following the injections. We see that there's still equal forelimb muscle mass. We see there's no restrictions on range of motion in the shoulder. It's very comfortable. You can see the abduction angle or the measurement that we have within the shoulder is almost identical still between left and right, and Bayer seems very comfortable. This is an x-ray 12 months following the injections of stem cell and PRP combination. And you can see the side on the left, the joint still looks very, very good. There's no signs of osteoarthritis. We cannot see the soft tissues, of course, within the, the joint itself. That's why we rely on ultrasound or MRI or second look arthroscopy. But radiographically or looking at x-rays, no signs of arthritis in this very, very damaged joint that we were dealing with for Bayer. Looking at objective measures or evidence-based medicine, we wanted to continue to perform gait analysis on Bayer. So here is Bayer doing a trot down the gait pressure walkway. And you can see equal distribution of weight between left and right and nice step and stride length. This is the data from Bayer's gait analysis 12 months after the injection of stem cell and PRP combination. And if you look at the bottom right, you can see the left and the right forelimbs. And you can see the buyer is placing an equal amount of weight between left and right, actually placing even more weight on the right forelimb, which was the injured forelimb compared to the left. But again, within variation, standard deviation, this is very, very normal to have just a small amount of variation between left and right. Um, but in Bayer's case, we're very, very pleased with Bayer's outcome as far as return to agility, as far as return to normal function, and the uh, function as far as the tendon healing from the treatment. So in conclusion, I think we can say that regenerative medicine may be considered for soft tissue injury in the canine, and especially in our active dogs and sporting dogs. As previously stated, it's not 
the silver bullet, however, we do have to include rehabilitation therapy, orthopedic devices, the use of medical management, in that team approach where we're including the owner, the general veterinarian, the rehabilitation therapist, as well as your re regenerative medicine type specialist. It's also absolutely critical that as owners seek treatment for their dogs for this, with this type of technology, that you seek out specialists trained in regenerative medicine and also proficient in musculoskeletal ultrasound. Because it's extremely important that that injection be guided, ultrasound guided, and get the targeted cells to the targeted location. This has also brought up some really good questions. Should we be using bone marrow versus adipose-derived or fat-derived? Should we be using cultured cells versus non-cultured cells? How many cells should we be using? Should we use combination therapy? Can we get the same response from just stem cells alone or just PRP alone, or do we really need to use this combination type therapy? And what about placebo-controlled? Where is the evidence-based medicine? Are we seeing as much of improvement in these combination therapies as we are placebo with rehabilitation therapy? Well, these are the answers that the CHF are trying to get within their 2013 study. We are so grateful to Dr. Knapp, his team, and his team of collaborators for their work on behalf of the health of our dogs, as well as for taking the time to present this webinar. To learn more about Dr. Knapp's research or to make a secure online donation to support CHF's work, please visit us online at www.akcchf.org. Thank you for listening.